Hey folks, it's great to see you this morning. Happy Father's Day to everyone out there who's a dad. I hope you have a great day today. And welcome to everybody who's watching online. Hey, you know, uh, last week I got about a little four-day vacation down in Southern California, seeing some family, and had a friend who had a family condo right on the beach at Newport Beach. Now, I don't know if you about if you know about Newport Beach. It, it is just a beautiful place. Everybody wants to live there and there's a reason. I mean, it's gorgeous. So, so we just walk out to the beach and, and we're sitting there. It's a beautiful 75 degrees, a light breeze. We go out in the ocean. We're having a great time in the waves, the piers right there, little ice cream shops, hamburger stands. And, and my wife and I are just kind of sitting there in our beach chairs. And we're thinking, "Man, This is the life. Wouldn't it be great to live here? I started thinking, yeah, it would be great to live here. (laughs) And after a while, I got to admit, I started to become a a little discontent with my own situation. I'm thinking, man, here's my, my friend here. You know, he owns his condo right on the beach. I'd like to own a condo right on the beach here. Um, I've got friends who minister down in Newport Beach. I'm kind of thinking, hey God, how come I'm not able to to minister down in in Newport Beach in the beauty of this place? You know, that's a common thing. Sometimes in life we can feel a little discontent with our own circumstances. Now, now don't get me wrong, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to kind of improve ourselves or improve our situation. But the problem typically comes when we start to feel resentful of what other people have. And sometimes that can turn into our own dissatisfaction with what God has provided for us. So this morning, uh, as we are rolling through our series in the book of Philippians, we come to the subject of contentment. The big question, you know, are, are you content right now in your life with the things that, that the Lord's given you? Now, I want to begin by defining uh, what contentment is. And for this morning, contentment is being satisfied with what you have, independent of your circumstances, You know, in Paul's letter, he's just finished um, encouraging the Philippians, these Christians who lived in, uh, in northern Macedonia, which is today northern Greece, and he's saying, listen, don't be anxious about anything, but with everything you're concerned about, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, the Lord. So he talks about peace. And then he follows it talking about what it means to be content. See, I think that's deliberate on Paul's part. Think about it. Contentment is an outflow of peace. And in the passage we're going to look at this morning, uh, the Apostle Paul models what it means to have peace with himself, peace with others, and peace with God, and how that manifests itself in being content. I'd like to read you our passage today out of Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13, and it says this, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you Philippians have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I'm to be content. Paul goes on and he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and and need for I can do all things through him who strengthens me man what a good word for us today especially if you've been struggling during this really crazy difficult time with being content let's talk to our heavenly father lord we thank you for this day that you've given us a day to pause from all the things that we're doing and Spend some time thinking about you, um, digging into your word, 
reflecting on our life, Lord, um, it's really easy at times to, to not be content with our circumstances, with the things that we have, with our place in life. Yet, God, um, in your word, there's great gain to have fellowship with you, a growing relationship with you, and to be content. Paul was in a difficult situation. He was in prison, and yet he was encouraging this small church in the city of Philippi to be content. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds this morning through the words of Paul and his example. In your name we pray, amen. Well, through those brief words of the Apostle Paul that I read to you this morning, I see four keys to learning contentment in our lives. And the first key is this, we need to learn to be thankful. That's where it starts. Now, I know that might sound basic, but I mean, how many of us at times, be honest, um, take what we have for granted? Or, or, or we might feel entitled um, at times. You know, I saw this a lot when I would take teenagers down to, uh, to do mission trips in Mexico and places in Central and South America. I, I remember one time I took a group down to Mexico and we had spent the week uh, ministering to children and we built a home for a family. And, and at the end of, of the week, um, the family wanted to honor our group, myself and these high school students, by, by making a meal for us. And the kids were all excited. They were like, wow, we're going to have, you know, a, a home-cooked, unique, authentic Mexican meal. This is going to be great. And they're probably dreaming about burritos and tacos and things like that. So, so we got to the house that night, you know, the, the home that we had built for this family. And they had put out a meal for us. And the kids looked at it, and it was different sort of stuff. Yeah, there were some tortillas, but there was kind of a meat dish that, that they couldn't quite identify. There was a, a, big, a big bowl of, um, of, of green stuff that we weren't sure what it was. And the family said, well, this is cactus. You know, oh, this is cactus. So, you know, a lot of the kids, they tried to be respectful and, and, and eat what was provided. But, man, some of the kids, I got to tell you, they just kind of turned their noses up at it. And they, they didn't eat. And they complained about the food. Later on, I learned that, uh, that that family made a real sacrifice to prepare that meal for us that night. They only had meat on their table maybe twice a month. And I shared that with, uh, with these American kids. You know, a lot of times we can take what we have for granted. Um, the, the clothes on our backs, the food on our table. You know, the Apostle Paul had, uh, had food on his table. As a Pharisee, the Bible even says that, that the Pharisees loved the, the places of honor, the chief seats at the banquets that they would be invited to. But uh, now Paul is not, not in that situation. Paul's in prison. And he's completely dependent on the gifts of others to meet his needs and for, for food. Hmm. And so Paul says this in verse 10. He says, you know, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, Philippians, that now at length you've revived your concern for me. He's saying, listen, uh, it's been a while, but, but, but you didn't have an opportunity to support me in my missionary efforts, telling people about Jesus. I get it, Paul is saying. Matter of fact, his current circumstance, he was in a, a prison in Rome, in Italy, and the Philippian church was in today what would be northern Greece, 100 miles away, hundreds of miles away. But the Philippian church knew that Paul was in need, and they sent uh, one of their own people, Epaphroditus, with a financial gift and, and maybe some other supplies to encourage and to provide for, for their dear apostle, Paul. And he's, he's rejoicing in the Lord about their gift. He's thankful to them. Man, that's really the first step in learning contentment 
is to learn to be thankful for what we have. Notice he doesn't criticize them. He doesn't put them down. He doesn't say, what you gave me wasn't enough, or man, it took you long enough to send me that gift, Philippians. No, Paul rejoices in the Lord greatly. He's thankful. You know, he goes on to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances. Man, whether you're doing great or, or whether you're having a tough time. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I mean, it says it right there. You want to know what God's will is? Be thankful, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your circumstance is. You know, one of the things that I've learned to do over the years is during my my prayer time uh, every day, I will actually count my blessings. I'll say, Lord, thank you for... uh, for the, for the job that I have, that I can provide for my family. Lord, thank you for the, the food on my table. Lord, thank you for the home that I get to live in. Lord, thank you that my, my kids have a, a place to get educated. Thank you for the cars that I drive. Lord, thank you for the things that you've provided. That's where a content heart begins. Secondly, <clears throat> the second key to learning contentment is to learn to avoid comparisons. Listen, as long as we compare, we'll never be content. I don't know what it is. It's in our human nature, right? We're always looking around, comparing our situation, who we are, what we have with other people. Now, let me ask a question. Why do we compare? Let me give you the answer. Because it's how we keep score, right? It's how we keep score, We want to see, man, do I have a nicer car than my neighbor? Do I have a bigger house than this person? Do I make more money than that person? That's why we compare typically through our our sinful, fallen human nature. I remember uh, there was a time in my life where uh, I lived next uh, next door to a guy who was younger than me, didn't have the education that I had. Matter of fact, he cleaned pools for a living, but man, he must have done pretty good. He had the same house I had, but he had a pool. I didn't. He had the biggest motorhome you've ever seen. That thing was amazing. <laughs> and, uh, and then he would, he would tow his toys. He had, he had motorcycles. He had four-wheelers. He had boats. I mean, everything. And every weekend, it seemed like he was packing up. And I'd say to my neighbor, hey, Jason, where are you going this weekend? Oh, we're going up to the lake. I'm bringing my boat. Where are you going this weekend? Ah, oh, we're going out to the desert with some friends, man. We're going to do some four wheel. It's going to be awesome. I mean, every week the guy was gone. I started to compare thinking, what the heck? You know, <laughs> I don't get to leave every weekend and take my family and do these little vacations. And I started to compare what I had with what my neighbor had. Listen, it's a trap. There's always going to be somebody, Right? That has a nicer car than you do, that has a bigger home than you do, that makes more money than you do, that has more toys than you do. You know, I go on down the list. Listen, comparison leads to jealousy and, and, and coveting and insecurity and ultimately to a feeling of being discontent with what we have and what the Lord has given us. And so, Paul goes on in verse 11 in Philippians chapter 4 and he says, now listen, Philippians, I'm so grateful. I'm rejoicing in the Lord, you know, for for your gift. But not that I'm speaking of being in need. For I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Underline that word learned. Circle it. Highlight it. You know, I think contentment isn't something that happens to us automatically. Even the Apostle Paul had to learn to be content. He had learned to be content in whatever situation, whatever circumstance he found himself in. You see, for the Apostle Paul, other people's circumstances or stuff or or situations or status had no bearing on his joy or his relationship with the Lord. Yeah, I was pastoring a church and had a friend there. His name was Dave. And, uh, and I noticed Dave just looked a little down, a little bummed out. And I said, Dave, what's the matter? And he said, yeah, I'm kind of down. I said, well, what happened? 
I said, well, honestly, I'm kind of ashamed of it. I, I was sitting there over the weekend, and, and I'm paying my bills, and all I could think of was my wife's boss, who's doing pretty good. He just won $6 million in the lottery. I said, wow. <laughs> he said, you know, here I am struggling. I'm trying to just, just make it, just pay my bills. And here's a guy who's well off anyway, and he just, just won $6 million in the lottery. I said, yeah, that's kind of insult to injury, isn't it? I said, well, hang in there, buddy. Listen, when you're tempted to look around, look up. Look up. It's easy to look around and to feel bad about our own circumstances and situation. But that's not contentment. That's not what God wants for us. Man, when we're tempted to look around, see what other people might have or their situations and their circumstances, no. Paul says, I look up. I've learned to be content in whatever situation I find myself in. Listen, satisfaction in life is tied to contentment. And so we need to learn to be thankful and we need to learn to avoid comparisons. The Apostle Paul said it this way in his letter to his assistant Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, Paul said this. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can't take anything out of it. You know, maybe that's where we got that saying. Hearse don't pull U-Hauls, right? <laughs> you can't take it with you. Paul makes that pretty clear. But then he goes on in verse, verse 8. But if we have food and clothing, with these we'll be content. What about the nice car, Paul? What about the nice beach house down in Newport? You know, what about those things? No. Paul says no. Godliness. Having that growing, close relationship with the Lord with contentment, that's great gain. And we'll be content if we have food and clothing. Wow. That's really something. When you see what Scripture teaches and what it means truly to be content. There's a third thing that we need to learn to be content people, and that's this. We need to learn to adjust to change. We need to learn to adjust to change. Why? Because life is full of ups and downs, right? Nothing's predictable. We'll experience good times in our lives, but we'll also experience tough times in our lives, and the choice is gonna be up to us. Are we going to respond with joy and, and contentment, or are we gonna just kinda trip along through life being miserable? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I understand that people respond to change differently. Some people welcome change. You know, change is a good thing, and they just roll with it gladly with a big smile on their face. And, and then there are those who, you know, they'll deal with change as it comes, and they'll make adjustments and find contentment. And then there's others that just resist change completely, and they'll never be happy. They'll never be satisfied. They don't want anything in their lives to change. It's way too upsetting for them. You know, over the last three years, uh, I've had to move my family two times, <clears throat> and um, I have a daughter. <laughs> it's been really hard on her. She had a great life in San Diego, California, uh, <clears throat> just about 20 minutes from the beach. She had grown up there, made all her friends there from preschool, kindergarten up to sixth grade, uh, and she was doing great. And then uh, I had a job change. And the Lord moved us to the central of Washington State. And there's not a lot there. Uh, the closest town to where we lived was an hour away. And my, my little girl was not happy that we had to move to Washington, away from the only life that she had ever known. But I got to tell you, with that change, she made the adjustment. She made some really great friends. Man, she was, she was doing great on the cross-country team, and she was the star of the school volleyball team, and she got involved in her church youth group, and she was learning how to play guitar. I mean, she was knocking it out of the park. She was number one in her class in the junior high there in Washington. She did such a great job. And then after about well, only two years at that church, I had to tell her again, hey, honey, we got to move. Uh, God's calling us 
to another place. And, and that was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. And, uh, and she, was, she was bummed out. She was sad. Man, another change. And she was just, you know, 12, 13 years old. But we came here uh, to, to Manteca, California, to this wonderful church, Calvary Community Church. And I was real concerned about my daughter, how she would do. Well, she was willing to make the adjustments. She made some new friends at school. She got involved and did great on her school volleyball team and on a club team. She, 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 she jumped right in with the church youth group, made some friends, and again, top of her class in school. It's amazing. My daughter is learning what it means to be content because life's unpredictable. Life's gonna, gonna throw challenges at you, but rather than just get mad at, at her mom and dad, which she hasn't done, or get mad at God and turn her back on God, you know, none of that has happened. My little girl has shown such maturity. It really blows me away. Matter of fact, I wish a lot of adults <laughs> would learn to adjust to changes and be content like my little girl has. See, that was Paul's secret to contentment. He understood that in life, change is going to happen. And so you need to make the adjustments as you trust in the Lord day by day and respond with joy and being grateful and content with what, with what the Lord provides. And so he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12, as the letter continues, he says, remember, he said in verse 11, so I've learned to be content in whatever my situation is. Then he goes on, he says, now I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. He goes on and he says, in any and every circumstance. So he makes it pretty clear, right? He's not leaving anything out. Paul says in any, I don't care what it is, in any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of contentment. I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. You know, as a Pharisee, Paul knew abundance. Uh, he probably had wealth more than the average person. He had prestige of being a religious leader amongst the people. He had influence. He had power. All right? He had a lot. It was a time of abundance and plenty for Paul. But then God got a hold of his life and, and, and took all that away. And said, you know what, Paul, you're going to suffer on account of me. As you involve yourself in this new ministry that I'm giving you to tell the world about salvation in my son, Jesus Christ. And through that ministry, Paul learned need. And he learned um, <laughs> not having the things that he had had before. During his ministry, he was run out of town. He didn't have the respect and the prestige that he had formerly enjoyed. He, there were times when he was beaten with whips and with rods, bloodied to a pulp. There were times when he was in danger on the road from thieves and robbers. He, he didn't have a nice home. There were times when he was homeless, without a, a roof over his head. There was a time where he was stoned with rocks and left for dead. Several times he was shipwrecked in the open ocean. And now he was in prison, facing an audience before the most powerful man in the known world at the time, not knowing if he would live or die. Paul says, I've learned the secret of con contentedness contentment. I've learned to be content in any and every circumstances, whether in plenty or in hunger, whether in abundance or in need. Wow. You see, the Apostle Paul refused to allow his circumstances to steal his joy, and he's trying to teach and model that to the Philippians 
and you and I as well. See, he learned not to compare or become discontent with God no matter what. Paul learned to adjust to the changes in his life, and that enabled him to be content. Now, let me ask a question. How are you doing? How are you doing three, going into four months <laughs> of lockdown, of this COVID-19 virus, of not being able to go where you used to go, interact the way you used to interact, having some of your freedoms taken away, maybe having to wear a mask. How are you doing? How's your level of, of contentment? Wow. Maybe another question is, what determines your level of, of contentment? Is it things like possessions, or, or power, or prestige, or pleasure? What determines your level of contentment? You know, for Paul, he was content and joyful, independent of his circumstances. Whether he was the guest of honor, having the chief seat as a banquet when he was a Pharisee, or whether he found himself in a Roman jail with the threat of death hanging over his head. See, think about it this way. There are basically two kinds of circumstances in life. Those that we can control and those that we can't, right? And, and typically, our faith is tested during those situations where we don't have any control. Proverbs chapter three, verses five to six, has a great answer. I don't know about you, but this is another one of those life verses for me that I've memorized, that I try to live out. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart. That goes for our nation, dealing with the tension, this these changes that are being called for with social and racial injustice, with, with this world pandemic that we're, we're all trying to navigate. Trust in the Lord with all that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Yet what do we do? In all your ways, acknowledge the Lord and he will make straight your paths, trusting in the Lord. That's the ability to adjust to change and to experience contentment. There's a final thing that I want to encourage us to learn, to, to be people of contentment in what the Lord has provided for us in this life, and that is this. We need to learn to draw on Christ's power need to learn to, to draw on the power of Jesus. Man, if you're a follower of Jesus and you're not connecting with the power of the Lord, you are missing out on an incredible source of, of strength and power and encouragement. You know, a survey was just done, and this survey apparently takes place on a, on a pretty regular basis, maybe an annual basis. It was done in 2020. And I read about it back in March, and it's called the General Social Survey. And it's reputable. It was published uh, in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, in the LA Times. And it's a survey that tries to determine how happy Americans are. Simple, simple, simple question. How happy are you? And the survey has found that Americans have... Um, been on a downward trend the last 20 years of not being very happy people. <laughs> we, are, we are losing national happiness in the 2000s. For the last 20 years, the survey is finding, and it gave all kinds of different reasons. There were economic reasons. There were political reasons. There were racial reasons, reasons of injustice, health reasons, psychological reasons, educational reasons. However, they found that people who responded to the survey, the most happy people, were people who had some sort of religious involvement in their lives. Isn't that something? 
They had faith. They had faith. Maybe they were tied into something that the rest of society (laughs) doesn't know about. I know about it. You know, for me, I found that without the power of Jesus working in my life, man, I can can often find myself discouraged, disappointed, depleted, discontent, and dissatisfied with my life. But, But praise be to God. As the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, 13, as he goes through this this whole section talking about his hardships, his gratitude for the gift that the Philippians have given to him, how he's learned to be content in all circumstances, whether he's doing great or he's going through really tough, difficult times, what's his conclusion to the matter? I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do all things through Jesus who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. And I know that I've experienced that in my life as well. Paul is saying, listen, with the power of Jesus Christ working in me, I can make it through imprisonment. I can make it through hunger and thirst and cold and isolation and danger and hardship and loss of my freedom. And and, and I can make it through physical strain and pain and even the threat of death. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you can do all things through the power of Jesus Christ working in your life as well as you learn to trust him. Be grateful and content for everything that he's provided for you and your loved ones. Listen, want to learn contentment? Regardless of your circumstances, folks, you got to learn to draw on Christ's power. How do we do that? Through weakness. Through weakness. Through admitting that we don't have all the answers, that we don't have all the resources, we don't have all the power on our own. We connect with the power of Jesus by our weaknesses, by coming to the Lord as a child, as the scriptures suggest. Growing in trust, in dependence, in reliance, humility on the Lord. The Apostle Paul said it this way. In the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 9 through 10, he, he talks about this this secret of contentment and the secret of understanding that it's only through our weaknesses that we can truly experience the power of Jesus in our lives. Paul says that that the Lord said to him, you know, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, Jim. My grace is sufficient for you. Dave and Don and Tom and Jim. God says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then he goes on and he says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly, Paul says, of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He goes on. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See what he's saying here, folks? (laughs) Yeah. Life can be unpredictable. Life can throw all kinds of challenges our way. We might look around And thinking, man, look at that person's situation. They've got it so much better than I do. Look what they have, so much more than I have. Hey, the Lord says, listen, that's not what it's all about. Be content. You're going through a tough time? Recognize your weaknesses. 
draw on my strength and my power, and you will experience joy and love and peace and contentment in your life. Remember, godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with wealth, godliness with popularity, godliness with prestige, godliness with possessions and stuff, is that great gain? No. Godliness with contentment is great gain. My prayer for all of us is simple, that we would find our contentment, our joy, and our strength in the Lord Jesus Christ.